Oh, I'm battling mugwort and, and uh, oriental bittersweet at my house. There's a uh, Atlantis trees on the empty lot next door. Um, aside from not much I can do about the, the Atlantis trees on the property next door, but um, aside from a lot of pulling, do you have any suggestions for the mugwort and the oriental bittersweet? Um, this is okay. So, um, Jesse, I'll try to answer your question. Um, to Karen, both of those um, plants are really kind of horrific problems. Um, let me start with bittersweet. Um, bittersweet is actually, I think, more um, easier to control than the mugwort. Um, although, having said that, it's not easy. Um, Cutting, so one of the methods that people recommend first is mechanical. We recommend, you know, using um, chemicals as kind of the last resort. And the problem with bittersweet, one of the problems with bittersweet, like some of our other invasives, is that um, it doesn't always respond well to, um, to pulling, to just pulling it up. But um, having said that, if you really get after it and pull it, and when it comes back up again, cut it, and when it comes back up again, as it might, cut it again, what you're going to do is you're going to um, um, kind of incapacitate the root structure so that it's not able to supply what the plant needs to grow. Um, so I'm talking about small bittersweet that are coming up in the ground because I'm guessing, Karen, you probably have some, if you have some going up your trees. Um, you can, you know, cut it off at the severed uh, bittersweet that's growing up a tree so that it's not connected with the bittersweet coming up the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, the, and the frustrating thing is that you're just going to have to keep after it. So I mean, yeah, than pulling. I wouldn't. I mean, you can. It'll it'll die up there in the trees right now. It's got fruit on it, um, so it's you know probably the birds are eating it and they're going to spread it around your yard. Um, it's really a hard one because um, it's so rampant. At least in where we are, um, I have eliminated from my yard, but it's on. Um, across the street from me when I go out to get the mail it's up there it's um on the house next door to me so the birds are still um seeding it into my yard um um the one good thing is that if you can recognize those bright orange roots it's mm -hmm. really easy to pull up and um and I I do find it kind of everywhere so in the early spring I kind of get out there and I've got lots of very dense um, beds of perennials coming up in the springs, but I'll, I really try to make a good attempt to get that bittersweet out quickly before it gets a good underground root structure to it. It's a tough one. Um, mugwort, I'm going to say mugwort's maybe even worse because um, from our experience in Galloway, when it's invaded some of the um, rain gardens and um, native perennial gardens that we've put in, when you try to pull it out, um, if just a tiny bit of the root is left, it will then come up again. Um, maybe Barb can speak to this because she's been working on a rain garden for years and has had some success, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. We, have, we have mugwort specialists <laughs> that work in our rain garden. Um, they recognize it. They know how to go after it. We try to do it after a rain because it loosens the roots and you have a better chance than of getting the whole root out. Um, but it, it is a tough one because it's so, so very invasive. It just spreads so fast and all over the place. So it's a tough one. Okay. But the, the best thing to do would be to just constantly keep after it. I did eliminate it pretty much from my yard, which was not an easy feat. Um, but um, I've just, you know, for years just kept after it and 
um, very, very little of it shows up in our yard now. Oh, there is hope then. Thank you. Yes, there is hope. Okay. <laughs> the other the other thing I'm going to add to this for people listening is with mugwort and other, in that case, we're talking about a perennial, but um, you want to make sure as you're pulling it up that you put in something that's going to shade the ground. So you want to put in some kind of, that's a situation where you might want to put in some kind of, I'm going to say a little bit aggressive native perennial that's really gonna shade any little um, mugwort seedlings out. You can't leave that ground then bare. You know, if you've eradicated your mugwort, make sure there's something else in there, some good native perennial that's gonna be able to outcompete it in the future. Um, Cause leaving the ground bare um, makes it easier for, you know, the plant to come back in. Thank you. It's a good point. Yes. Um, I, this is my first event I've ever attended. I thought, I thought the video was excellent. Uh, I mean, just so informative. And I'm wondering, um, is there any way you could put this on YouTube or something? I mean, I'd like to see it again because I, I'm just a novice. It um, is, it is on YouTube. Of ground, um, mm -hmm. and, and woods. Uh, I just thought you you all did a really good job. It is on YouTube. Uh, if you just uh, type in YouTube, twelve tenacious invasives, it will come up. Um, it might come up first with a with tenacious B, which is a rock rap group. But uh, <laughs> just just hang in there, and you'll find twelve tenacious invasives. So it's a we. Uh, I don't know if uh, we can send a link to you, but the brochure that Barbara made up is uh, quite extensive and has lots of information uh, and also refers to the video. So we'll send a link if we haven't already to uh, to Rich and um, Scott. Scott. Well, actually, I put the link right in the chat here. Okay. If anybody cares to look at that, uh, you just hit the little chat button at the bottom and uh, we'll see that. Yep, Jesse's up for an Academy Award this year for that. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't have we couldn't have our friend Eric Schrading here tonight, but um, he's a good friend and he working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, he gets into a, these situations. And most of the invasives that we filmed were either at Stockton University, or a lot of them were on the um, uh, Forsyth Refuge in national lands. So he was very correct about because we are on an Atlantic flyway, the birds are drop dropping seeds, have been dropping seeds forever, and we are uh, beset with native invasive plants around our area. Okay, I see a question here from Sonia here in the chat. Um, she says, I have Japanese wisteria that's creeped into my yard and climbs my white pines. How can I eradicate it? Okay, so we've got, we're, we're, we're tackling all the hard ones, but in fact, they all are pretty difficult. I don't know that there's an easy invasive to get rid of. I'm trying to think if there's one. Um, wisteria can be pretty challenging. Um, and um, again, cutting it, um, cutting it so that you've severed the connection between the the, the root system and the tree. Um, but for all of these kind of difficult um, woody vines, um, I would recommend going to um, some of the really good sites uh, on the website. So um, the way in which I, do, I typically do that, and there might be some master gardeners um, in attendance listening, but um, having worked in the county extension office, I learned that the way to find out really good reputable information about plants was to type in the problem. So in this case, control of wisteria and then dot edu. So you come up with a university um, and um, a lot of them and you try to find the, the one that's the most local and then they'll run through and they'll start with mechanical way, which is the cutting of it. The problem is that, you know, there's all these um, wisteria vines that typically go right over the ground and, you know, um, but they, they'll walk you through that and then they'll end up saying, 
Um, in worst case scenario, here's the chemical that you can use and this is how to apply it. So um, I find that that, that information is um, probably a good place for um, you know, homeowners to go to. Um, Penn State has excellent information um, and um, a lot of the nearby University of New Hampshire has good stuff. Cornell has good stuff. Um, but it's, but you're not going to a site where someone's trying to sell you, <laughs> heaven forbid, a chemical to apply. Um, but for, for all of those, and especially like Tree of Heaven, which Karen mentioned was across the street from her, Penn State has a really good um, YouTube video on um, how to get rid of Elanthus, which, as I said in the film, is the favorite host plant. Um, of the spotted lanternfly. Um, so there's a lot of good information um, online that you can look at. Um, you know, Barb and Steve and Jack and I would always say start with mechanical, you know, but in some cases, if you're dealing with, you know, a yard full of wisteria, you know, that may not work. So, um, so my recommendation to all of you is to, you know, if you're having um, real you know, real serious problems with invasives and you've tried uh, mechanical means of getting rid of them to go online and see, work your way, you know, from the easiest to, um, you know, the next step and the next step down. Another thing is there's a good book. I'm going to hold it up. I don't know if that's going to work because um, I'm backwards, but it's Invasive Plants. Um, it's a guide to ID and it's uh, written by Kaufman and Kaufman. And this is just a really good resource because it has all the plans we've talked about in the film, plus the other you know, 10 or 15, which we couldn't, we could not um, cover in the film. And that does work you through identification and also control. I have to add that since the film was made, we've started to do some remediation of sites, particularly a 150 acre park that we have here in Galloway. And I, I have come to be a, a member of the Saul and Lopper College of uh, Action. Uh, so we have we have cut down so much wisteria. And as Jesse said, it is it, a very muscular vine. And um, it, we were too late for some of the very beautiful heritage trees that we had, but we have saved a lot of trees by mechanical cutting. And it's just cut, cutting up a section out of there. We, you know, I cut up maybe as high as I can reach and then down near the ground where we can still do some injection of the herbicide if we choose. But um, the wisteria was by far and away the most um, egregious as far as pulling down uh, trees, beautiful big established trees a lot of wild grape down here also uh bittersweet uh was are the main vines that we had to deal with so if you can save a tree um, it's a it's a wonderful thing and there are a lot of them out there that really need our help uh, and mechanical action can can save the day uh in many cases to save the tree okay a uh, question from Carol here. I have a large area of lesser celandine that's crowded out all the other plants. Any suggestions for eradicating it other than trying to manually extract all the bulbets and tubers? Well, I, you know, that's something we don't uh, have in Atlanta County. Um, having said that, you know, we'll probably run into it next spring. Um <laughs> So I'm not sure I can, I, I, I don't, I haven't, it's not one I've dealt with. Um, I'm sure there's something, you know, if you, if you go through the process I just talked about, because it's really recognized in New Jersey as a highly invasive plant. I'm sure it's covered in the Kaufman and Kaufman book. Um, and I'm sure you could find online. The problem is that it typically wants to grow in moist areas and that makes uh, remediation much more difficult. So I'm sorry, I, I don't I don't have an answer. I know there's maybe an answer out there, but I don't I do not know what it is. 
I, th I think that's one of the plants that has to kind of be dug out because the tubers, um, if you p just try to pull it, the tubers will stay and just keep growing. So um, I think that's one that you might want to think about trying to dig out a section and then replanting it immediately, as Jesse mentioned before, with, with something that will shade out the ground, um, a rather aggressive native, beneficial native. Okay, I'm just looking at the Kaufman and Kaufman book, and it says small scattered plants can be dug out with a trowel. The care must be taken to remove all tubers. Since foliage dies back in summer, herbicides containing glyphosate, which you would know as Roundup, should be applied in late winter or early spring, which is above 50 degrees. But then you've got, you know, if it's a wet area, you've got habitat for amphibians. So you have to, if you were going to use any chemicals at all, you'd have to do that when, before those amphibians came out. So removing the tubers is, is the um, least yeah. um, 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 what problematic way to, to go in terms of the ecosystem that surrounds those plants. Um, I don't know how bad the situation is with the spider and lantern fly in, in Gloucester, but we're certainly seeing it down here now. And um, different schools of thought about handling tree of heaven. Uh, some folks, including Eric Schrading, our fellow that was in the film, is um, not recommending cutting it uh, at this time. They're recommending a, a saturation of, a, um, of one of the pesticide herbicides that they use. It seems that if you cut it, it will stimulate it and, and it will start to pop up uh, 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 shoots everywhere uh, in great numbers. So uh, I think you need to check, keep checking uh, the latest data on that to, uh, if it's on your properties, obviously you can cut it down and just be vigilant about keep cutting it so it will exhaust the root system. That's probably the best thing for the individual hand, land owner, but on large scale, uh, municipal and um, like along the train lines, it's really rampant. Um, it's hard to keep after it. So they're trying some chemical means to uh, get into the root system. Evidently, just under the bark, the cambium layer transmits the chemical rather quickly down into the root system. And that's where you have to get to kill it. Similar to uh, treating bamboo and Japanese knotweed. Um, it's not something that the individual homeowner, the homeowner will not particularly want to do this, but uh, you can you can cut it and exhaust the root system. That's probably your best bet as a as a land as a private landowner. Um, yeah, and I I did mention that the the Penn State YouTube on um, Tree of Heaven Control, which is about eight minutes long, is is really good. Um, it talks about what Steve just mentioned, which is that cutting it um, um, makes the situation worse because um, you get a lot of suckering and, and growth. And it talks about when you should um, try to deal with a tree and exactly what you should do. And it's such a good, um, it's such a well done um, piece. And, and since Tree of Heaven is really the preferred host plant of the spotted landfly that it might be good to share with, you know, your uh, municipalities, you know, if the people in townships are thinking about doing something, this would be the kind of information they need. Because I've seen places in Galloway where um, they've gone in and just mowed down Atlantis. And now where you might've had 20, you now have 2000. <laughs> it's, it's really, problematic. Um, so Penn State, YouTube on um, control of Atlantis. Scrape the egg masses now <laughs> and over the winter time. Yeah. Scrape the egg masses off anything you can find. They won't, they'll be on just anything. They can be on your car, they can be on your house, can be on other trees and bushes, but that gray mortar like, like uh, slather of once you find it, you'll you'll know what to look for. But um, 
that's the state that we're in right now where we have to try to look for the egg masses. Yeah, the sort of the spotted lanternfly is quite uh, prominent here in Gloucester County right now. And yes, we do have issues with the lanthus trees. I know in, in Tall Pine State Preserve, I know Karen's involved with that also. And uh, unfortunately, the one thing it's easy to get the state to do is to cut things down. It's maybe a little bit harder to get them to apply, uh, you know, some chemical treatment. Uh, but we'll have to try to push them in the right direction to uh, control this thing. Yeah, and I think the one important thing Jesse might have mentioned, but as the phrase goes, nature abhors a vacuum. So as soon as you get something under control, you need to get in a dense planting of, of natives uh, and don't wait because it, it just uh, is no time before things come back. We've had that experience many times with mugwort and uh, it will it will be glad to come back unless you uh, solarize it or uh, plant plant natives to uh, cover and create shade. Okay. What, what sort of natives have you used in your like remediation efforts? Um, what's best recommended? Well, it depends on the situation. Yeah, I guess it does. For, yeah. And, and for Jesse, for some ground covers, the uh, golden ragwort. Yeah. So the, 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 the natives that sometimes people call them um, thugs. <laughs> I don't use that term uh, about <laughs> native um, perennials, but golden ragwort is something that will very quickly come in and make a dense colony. It's evergreen, so it's gonna shade the ground all year long. Um, something like, you know, something like that. Um, some others that are, um, that come in fairly quickly and, um, White wood aster is, is one that'll take some shade that will come in and cover the ground. Um, there's a bunch of, um, let me think of some others. Um, the two golden rods that I'll put up with shade, um, zigzag golden rod and blue stem golden rod spread pretty quickly. Um, let me think of some others. But something that spreads, liar leaf sage is one that really self seeds and spreads very quickly. Um, so some of those plants that y you, uh, might hesitate to put in, but if you're looking at an area that's really degraded and been overrun with invasives, you know, having a, a native ground cover would be preferable to having those invasives jump back up again. Mm -hmm. I think barren strawberry is often recommended as a fill-in, uh, mm -hmm. um, when people are creating rain gardens and such mm -hmm. to keep ahead of, of uh, weeds coming in between, uh, that's widely recommended by uh, some folks, barren, barren strawberry. And it's, that's another one that's fairly evergreen here. So, um, which is, which um, helps to um, keep something else from coming back in. We have a lot of, um, non-native weed seeds that um, come up in the cool season um, before some of our native plants come up. So if you've got something that's semi-evergreen or evergreen, you're, that's really good. We have to put in the shameless plug for, for Dr. Doug Tallamy. If, uh, if you haven't uh, read some of his books, uh, it's probably the best uh, read you'll get about uh, perhaps the uh, Bringing Nature Home is his first book which will really get you ex excited about reading some of his uh, b books after that, uh, Nature's Best Hope, and most recently, the, the Nature of Oaks, which is quite fascinating. And also, I think Jesse and Jack, uh, you guys introduced us to Mount Cuba down in Delaware, which uh, Dr. Tallamy's ne neck of the woods, but you can go and see all year, well, most, I guess it's open all year, but most during the progression of the year, you can see how the the various uh, layers of vegetation work in the native world uh, to accomplish what we're all trying to achieve here, to crowd out invasives. All right. Well, I'd like to thank our presenters. It's an excellent movie, and I think we had a very good discussion, very, very educational. Uh, I know I learned a few things, and uh, like I said, it's a, it's a problem you know, many homeowners have, many public spaces have, you know, I'm sure all over the state. So it's very
very good to get this information out there. There's Thank no, you so much. No question about strength in numbers, too, if you have a society or a group like yourselves to get some folks together and have a, I, we kind of call them grunting parties where you can get out there and really uh, <laughs> raise some hell with these uh, plants. And they, when they go, when you can make some progress, it really makes you feel good if you can help each other out. Almost like a barn raising, you know what I mean? But uh, get out there and lop and chop and uh, it's good exercise and uh, make light of a bad situation. And uh, we can work this out. I like that. Lop and chop. Lop and chop, baby. Yeah. Lop and chop. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for having Thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for, uh, you know, working uh, uh, um, virtually with well, us here. We're glad that uh, that we could do it this way, too. To make that's it great. great. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks Thank for having you. me. Thank you. Okay. Sure. All your work. Thanks. Oh, bye. Take care.